Hello. In this and succeeding videos, we are going to look at the homonuclear diatomics from the second row of the periodic table. The first molecule from the second row of the periodic table that we are going to examine is lithium-2. Lithium-2 consists of two lithium atoms. And we recall that lithium has three electrons in two orbitals, in the 1s and in the 2s orbitals. So we're sketching in the lithium atomic orbitals on the right and left hand sides of our table. Since lithium has three valence electrons, let's fill in the atomic orbitals with the three electrons that lithium has. We can consider the two electrons in the 1s orbital to be core electrons, and we often consider the one electron in the 2s orbital to be a valence electron. In MO theory, frequently we are sure to include all the electrons. We know that there's an interaction between 1s orbitals, especially if they have the same or similar energies, to form a lower energy bonding combination, which we call a sigma orbital, and a higher energy sigma antibonding orbital, which slightly destabilizes the system. Similarly, with 2s orbitals, they have the same symmetry as 1s, and we end up with a lower energy bonding combination, which we call sigma, and a higher energy antibonding combination, which we call sigma star. Frequently, these are numbered, so we can think of this as being 1, sigma, and then this is 2. Just to give a little more specificity to which orbital we're talking about. And we can highlight from which orbitals the MOs were formed by showing kind of a dashed line or a lightly colored line showing the atomic orbitals from which the molecular orbitals were constructed. And we can show it like that. There we go. And our last step is simply to fill the electrons into the available molecular orbitals using precisely the same rules that we do when we fill electrons into atomic orbitals. We apply the alpha principle. We have six electrons. So the first two electrons will go into the first sigma bonding orbital. Again, we have to make sure that we fulfill the Pauli exclusion principle in which we can only stick two electrons in the same orbital if they have opposite spins. The next two electrons go into one sigma star and then the last two electrons go into the two sigma. So that accounts for all six of the electrons. Our next step is to calculate the bond order for this particular compound. And we notice that we have one, two, three, four electrons in bonding orbitals. We have two electrons in antibonding orbitals, and we recall that we subtract those, the bonding electrons from the antibonding electrons, divided by half, and this gives us a bond order for this particular compound of one, which is consistent with our intuitive understanding of a single bond between two atoms. The next compound that we are going to investigate is B2-diboron. We recall that boron has electrons in the 1s, 2s, and 2p orbitals for a total of five electrons in each atom. We draw the 1s orbitals for each of the two boron atoms at roughly the same horizontal level to indicate that they're at exactly the same energy because they're both boron. And we show the five electrons that each boron has. The three 2p orbitals are drawn horizontally to show that in the absence of interactions, these three 2p orbitals are degenerate. So now we start looking for the combinations of atomic orbitals 
that will give us molecular orbitals. You already know about the 1s combination that we get a lower energy bonding combination called sigma and a higher energy antibonding combination called sigma star. We often give them a prefix of one. And the same situation occurs with the 2s orbitals. We just kind of erase that to make it a little more obvious that the 2s are exactly the same energy. I want to give a false implication there. So the 2s orbitals, just as in lithium, will overlap to get a bonding combination which is lower in energy, which you might call 2 sigma, and a higher energy combination which we call 2 sigma star. And we could highlight the relationships here by just drawing a light orange line to show that the molecular orbitals came from particular atomic orbitals. So far, so good. With the overlap of 1s, 2s, 3s orbitals, we only have two possible combinations. Once we get to the p orbitals, we have three p orbitals interacting with three p orbitals to give us a total of six molecular orbitals. And here's where the, the combinations start to become very complicated. For B2, the lowest energy bonding combination will actually have pi symmetry. So we have two doubly degenerate uh, pi bonding orbitals, which are followed by a sigma bonding orbital. Try to draw these carefully to show that they're lower in energy than the two Ps. Let me kind of just redraw this one slightly. Here, just give ourselves a little more room. And we'll be sure to put our electrons back in. There we go. So to emphasize that the pi bonding and the sigma bonding combinations are lower in energy than the 2p orbitals from which they originated. And then higher energy, we have a two pi bonding combinations by antibody combinations, and the highest energy is going to be in a sigma antibody. So these are often three, three, and give that a four, and a four. Now, in the case of boron, this is the combinations that we get. So let's just show from whence the molecular orbitals came. This can get to be a little confusing, so I'm going to put the lines on one side so that the drawing is not too cluttered. And now we have the same situation we had before, in the sense that now we have a total of 10 electrons, and we need to fill up the molecular orbitals using the same rules that we use for atomic orbitals. So two electrons go here, two go here, two go here, and two go here, which gives us eight electrons so far. So just applying the alpha principle, we are able to allocate the first eight of the electrons. Then we have two remaining electrons, and we notice we have a, a doubly degenerate pair of pi binding orbitals. So here we apply Hunt's first rule, as we would for atomic case, and put one electron, the same spin, in each of the two pi orbitals. Having done that, we can now calculate the bond order for this particular compound. And we notice that we have two, four, five, six bonding electrons. We have a total of two, four antibonding electrons, which gives us a bond order of one for this compound. So Diboron is held together by a single bond, because the bond order is one. A very peculiar feature of B2 is that this single bond is actually a pi bond, which is quite a contrast with the general case in organic chemistry, where a single bond will invariably be a sigma bond, and then the second and third double and triple bonds will be of pi character. So here we actually have a single bond that is of pi character for B2. B2 also has another very important property, and we notice that it has, in the pi orbitals, it has two unpaired electrons. 
Any compound that has unpaired electrons is said to be paramagnetic. We can experimentally verify that compounds are paramagnetic because if we weigh them in vacuum and then weigh them in a magnetic field, these compounds will be drawn into the magnetic field so they will weigh more weighed in the magnetic field than weighed in vacuum. On the other hand, if the compound were to weigh less in a magnetic field, that weigh more in vacuum, it would tell us that it was diamagnetic and that all the electrons in the compound were paired. Thank you very much for your attention. Have a good one.